Hello and welcome to Red Green Refactor. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain what Red Green Refactor is, describe why this process is important, and you should be able to articulate two guidelines for writing robust tests. And before we go on, this video is, uh, is about testing, but we're not going to go over the specific uh, sort of aspects of testing syntax or testing frameworks. We're just going to be focusing on the process of testing. This is about your behavior as you go and write the tests. So uh, I won't stop to explain some of the things I'm doing in the test as, as, as far as the technical stuff goes. So the process we're talking about is largely referred to as TDD, or Test Driven Development. And the main concept is that you write a failing test before you write any code, you make the test pass, and then you change the code to uh, make it more resilient to future changes. So writing a failing test first is the step where you go red. And you, as you'll see in a minute, the reason they say you'll go red is because the terminal output is literally red. Uh, most terminal uh, test runners, browser test runners, and uh, IDE test runners show failing tests as red. And then when you make the test pass, the output becomes green, and then you refactor. And there are two guidelines to keep in mind while you're writing tests. And again, there's nothing technically that is going to force you to do this. This is a, a personal discipline and a process that you can follow to ensure that you have very high quality tests and very high quality code. The first one is only write code in response to a failing test. While you might be tempted to go in and write things that appear easy without having tests around them, if you only write code in response to a failing test, you'll be sure that you have very, very good coverage on the code that you write. The second guideline is to make the tests pass using the simplest code possible. This is where the majority of people criticize test-driven development because they believe that these early steps of making the code uh, work by the simplest means possible uh, seems a little bit um, maybe, maybe naive or maybe wasteful. And we'll see in a moment that that one act of doing the simplest thing possible to make the test pass is what ensures that your test suite is also robust and complete. And so these two things work together. Let's see how this works in practice. Let's say that I want to build a robot class and I want to test uh, that the robot can be powered on and powered off. The first test I'm thinking about writing is just if I instantiate a robot, the robot should be off by default. So if I come in here and I describe my robot, uh, I could say it is off by default. So here I'm going to instantiate a robot and I'm going to expect that the robot's status should be, or in this case should equal, off. Now notice over there on the left, I don't have a file named robot.js. Nowhere in this file do I define robot, and, uh, and that's okay. I'm writing the test first in the red-green refactor cycle. What I want to get to is red. So I'll come over to the terminal, I'll run the test. Notice that I'm going to run this test with a dash W flag, which means I won't have to keep running it. So right here I see uh, I have one failing test, and it's a reference error because robot is not defined, and the place where it's failing is on line six of the test. So the first thing I'm going to do is come back to line six, and right there, robot is not defined. And that makes sense. In order to get my code into the test, I'm going to need to require it. So robot is going to be the result of requiring the robot file in my lib directory. Now when I come back, I see something else. This is not a test failure. This is a straight up error in JavaScript. And it says, it cannot find module lib robot. And that makes sense to me because I don't have a file named robot in my lib directory. So I'll come over here and I'll create a robot.js file. And when I come back, uh, this is one problem with the way the test watcher works. Um, if you make changes to your implementation, it doesn't 
doesn't pick up. So here I see that uh, object is not a function. And I see that that's on test, robot test.js line 7. And so I'll come here and it says object is not a function. Well, I see that the new keyword is in front of robot. So I think that robot uh, expects a function there. So over here, uh, I'm going to write a function robot. And I'll save that. I'll rerun my tests. And I'm getting the same error. So I made a small change. I reran my tests, but I'm getting the same error. Huh. Now I remember. I have to go back and I have to export this. So now module.exports is a function. Again, the simplest test possible to make this pass. I'm realizing that for this demo, dash w is not going to be very helpful. Okay, so here I see a new error, reference error, expect is not defined on my robot test, test.js line 9. So I come back to my test, and I see expect, and this is just purely a test problem. Up here, by mistake, I included assert from Chai's library and not expect, and so I need to change that come back, run my test. Now I have a different error, a type error. Undefined is not a function, and this is on robot test test.js line 9. So I come over here and I go to line 9. So I see undefined is not a function. And I know expect uh, was working mostly because I know chai is expect. And so I see that robot.status, that status is not a function. If I were uh, if I didn't happen to know that, I could do lots of things, like I could pull this status out to a variable, and I could rerun the test. And here, I would see that it's now failing on line 8. And that tells me for sure that status is not a function. So back in my robot file, I could say something like this.status equals a function. Now, you might be tempted to just go ahead and implement this function right here. But it's so often the case that you make some small error, some syntax error, you forget a, a comma, or you use the wrong method, you forget the this keyword, that instead of going ahead and writing lots of code, it's best to just write the simplest code that can get you to the next assertion error, the next problem. So here, I now see that I'm past that. I, I now have the method defined and I'm getting an assertion error. Now what I'm getting back is undefined and I'm expecting it to equal off. So the simplest thing I can do to make this test pass is to just return off. And again, this is not the final production code that we want to see, but we're just following this first guideline, which is only write code in response to a failing test. So I run the test again, I see robot is off by default, passes. So we just did the first two steps. We were read, we wrote a failing test first, and then moved on and uh, made it pass. Now we're at the third step, refactor. You might look at code this simple and think to yourself, there's uh, absolutely nothing to refactor here. This is as simple as it could possibly be. But I'm not a fan of putting functions uh, on objects in the constructor so I'd rather come up and save our robot as a function and then put that status method on the prototype, which might look like this. And now my module exports can return robot. And I have code that uh, I like a little bit more. Let's see if that broke anything. I come back and run the test. I'm green. Now I'm confident that that small change that I made didn't negatively affect anything. Okay, so we did red-green refactor once. Let's see what it looks like again. So here, I want to be able to call the power method and have that flipped on. So so here when I call power, I want it to be on. So I instantiate it. Uh, 
here I'm going to call power and I'm going to expect that the robot status will equal on. I believe I'm red and I am. I see that the first test is passing, second one is failing, type error undefined is not a function, on line 14. I can check my assumption quickly. That's where I expected it to be. Now I can define a new method on robot called power. I might be tempted to implement this function right now, but let's say I did something stupid like forget this dot. The more code I write, now the more changes I have to go back to, to look at. So here I could run my test again and I see this terrible syntax error because I forgot the period. And so put that back. Now I see an assertion error, expected off to equal on. So I can't just go and change this to on. I mean, that might seem like the simplest thing I could do, but watch what happens. Now the test that I wrote passes, but the previous one that was passing before broke. So I have a regression. I altered previously working code to no longer work. So here uh, I have to actually write some real code. So this.status equals on. Maybe the object starts out with this.status equaling off. All right, so I went to, from red to green and I look at this to see if there's anything I want to refactor, and everything here looks pretty good, so I'll just keep going. So now I want to say that it turns off when you call power on a running robot. So here if I power up a robot and then call power again, I would expect the status to equal off. So I run the test. I see that the first two are passing, the third is failing, I see the assertion error expected on to equal off, and now I have to go and make my code a little more robust. So here I might say if this dot status is off, then the status is on, otherwise the status is off, and I can see how that works. And I'm green. Now I look at the code and I think to myself, well, this is a pretty big and bulky if statement and uh, I don't like the idea of storing strings. Really what I'd rather see is something like this dot on equals the opposite of whatever this dot on is. And I have to make a couple changes. Uh, and I can make these changes very quickly with high confidence because I have a very robust test suite. So now I run my tests again, and I'm in good shape. So the two guidelines I was following were only writing code in response to a failing test, and only writing the simplest code to make that possible. The benefits of following this rigorous TDD red-green refactor method where you only write code in response to a test and you only write the simplest code to make the test pass is that your code has very high coverage and that your tests, more importantly, are robust and complete. It's actually fairly easy to get good code coverage on your, uh, on your production code, even if you write tests after the fact. It's not as easy to ensure that your test suite itself is robust and complete. So following those two guidelines ensures both. And that was Red Green Refactor.